Hello everyone, I'm George from Ireland. So this video is going to be about um, statutory interpretation, continuing this a little bit. Oh my god, it's not very bright in here. What can I do to make it brighter? I don't know. Um, so uh, I'm just going to talk about the various aids which um, courts can use to help them in this endeavour. So they can look at the statute itself, and it often has a very long title. We usually know it's by its short title. There's a preamble to the act explaining what it's about. And there are other things. Uh, if you look at the Psychoactive Substances Act of 2016, if I move across here, is it brighter, a bit too dark? Um, and uh, in, in it, there's a section called interpretation, and it, it defines all the terms it uses for the avoidance of doubt. That's a, a phrase you see in statute quite a lot, for the avoidance of doubt. Um, parliamentary counsel, as in lawyers who draft these bills, they often think it'd be useful to uh, put the definitions in the act. Um, so in that, that act, 2016 act, it says what these uh, psychoactive substances are because, you know, judges are, you have usually no background in medicine or, or pharmaceuticals and, and spells out what it means by appropriation, this particular act, things like that. So um, therefore, the um, in, interpretations are not just at the end of the act. They might be in each chapter or each part of it and so on. Uh, anyway. So um, the Children Act of 1989 says what a child is, and that's someone below the age of 18. Because some people say, oh, you're not, you're not a child when you're 16, or you're still a child till you're 21. Though the Act makes it crystal clear. Um, so uh, then when it's there, there's not r room for interpretation. Um, but uh, there are complicated things in the Theft Act of 1968. Um, and the definitions of what honesty is and what property is, because dishonestly uh, obtaining a pecuniary advantage is is theft. Um, or the Human Rights Act um, of 1998, which says what a public authority is. It's important to remember because, of course, public authorities mustn't act in a way which is contrary to the to the Human Rights Act. Um, all right. So when we're thinking about interpretation, we've got to understand um, that uh, they uh, these statutes they explain the uh, reasons that the, these provisions exist in these statutes. And um, they are not meant to alter the definition of these words when they're used in another situation um, unrelated to the statute. Uh, so um, unlawful sex discrimination, race discrimination, these are, what exactly this is, is spelled out in the various relevant acts passed in the 60s and 70s, um, the Race Relations Act and so forth, so forth. Now, the various extrinsic aids which judges can use um, uh, in statutory interpretation. And there's even the Interpretation Act of 1978. Um, and it sets out the broad rules uh, for the interpretation of various statutes. It says what the United Kingdom is, it spells out what the High Court is, and so forth. Um, and uh, it also says that words, pronouns importing the masculine gender would be un understood to import the feminine gender as well. OK, now the, the, the parliament has increasingly opted for a gender neutral approach when drafting legislation in its wording. So look at dictionaries. So courts sometimes even thumb through the dictionary. There's R and Fulling, 1987, when the court had to decide what behavior was a, oppression. There's the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, 1984. Um, so uh, the Lord Lane, who was chief justice, he used a dictionary to help him. Um, so it, it, oppression in that dictionary, the Oxford English Dic Dictionary, it said it was the exercise of authority of power in a burdensome, harsh or wrongful manner, unjust or cruel treatment of subjects, inferiors, etc., the imposition of unreasonable or unjust burdens. So that helped him decide it. Um, so we're coming on to Hansard, which is the verbatim record of parliamentary debates. It's named after the family of the, Mr. Hansard. His family um, uh, owns that book. So Pepper and Hart, 1993, there was a seven-member constitution of the House of Lords, which heard a case where the Inland Revenue and um, the nine masters and the bursar of Malvern College were having a row. The bursar was in charge of the finances of this school about what were taxable benefits. This was pursuant to the Finance Act of 1978. So the judges um, uh, had to decide whether this legislation was ambiguous. Um, and so they returned to Hansard. Um, anyway, it was found by the um, uh, majority of them, only only the Lord Chancellor himself and Lord Mackay of Clash Fern dissented that the, um, the uh, courts um, couldn't uh, use um, the, the, the rules against courts using non-parliamentary material to help them ought to be relaxed so as to allow them to understand uh, parliamentary legislation. 
So they would only they would only do this, look at extra parliamentary documents when the legislation was opaque, or the literal meaning would lead to a ridiculous result, or um, when the material um, consisted of um, utterances made by a minister or some promoter of this piece of legislation, which led to it being passed, and it, w it was needed to read this in order to understand what the legislation was really about. Um, okay. So um, the, 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 as, as um, Lord Brown Wilkinson said, the law lord said, the intent is to give effect to rather than thwart the intent of parliament. They're not trying to block parliament's will. They're trying to give effect to it. OK, so um, there's a similarly in Pepper and Hart. Um, well, people people criticize this, um, say, that, oh, we shouldn't have done that. And they've, they've seldom looked at extra parliamentary documents. Um, so look at the coming on to the Human Rights Act of 1998 when the United Kingdom famously transposed the European Convention of Human Rights into domestic law, so that all courts have to interpret legislation in the light of the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, and the Section 3 of that same Human Rights Act, 1998, says that judges must interpret law um, in, in, in a way that's compatible with the, with the European Convention of Human Rights insofar as is possible to do so. So there might be situations where it's not possible to do so, or at least not fully. Um, so there's R and A, a two case of 2002. There's also Gadian and um, uh, uh, Godin Mendoza. Um, it said if the court feels that it can't interpret the legislation in a way that's in consonance with the um, European Convention on Human Rights, then it might it will have to issue a declaration of incompatibility. It's up to Parliament to amend the legislation or not. So what can we conclude after all this? You must uh, be mindful of what Lord Reed said in uh, Maunsell and Olin's 1975 case. The rules of construction are relied upon. They are not rules in the ordinary sense of having some binding force. They are our servants, not our masters. I won't read the whole rather lengthy quotation. So um, by construction here, we mean interpretation to construe. We don't mean construction as in building. Um, all right. So um, that uh, rounds off my, my uh, brief video tonight on statutory interpretation. So make sure you subscribe. And by the way, I teach people law online. So um, look me up, send me messages, um, and uh, we can do we can do online lessons tailored to whatever area of law you need. I can send you some of my past law work, examples of essays, problem solving questions, and so forth. So make sure you follow my other YouTube channels, George from Ireland and British Poesy. Toodaloo.